thank you. Um, I'm Irene Vag. Um, I work mainly um, on issues of internal displacement to women and children in international law. Um, but I also happen to be Ghanaian and I'm interested in the development issues that have been raised here. Um, I've been attending these meetings for quite some time now and sometimes it is a bit enervating and other times it is a bit depressing in that we've had so many really excellent policies that have been put forward and on paper they seem to be um, what is going to solve a lot of the developing world's problems. And yet, for some strange reason, th there is a hiatus between um, the, the, the polities uh, that have been devised and seem workable on paper and the transference of the ideals behind those policies into practical and workable and sustainable tactics that will actually deliver the real benefits to the people who are supposed to benefit from them. And I don't know how that is going to be addressed. It seems to me that a lot of money is spent on, 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 on these things. The other thing is uh, I am so glad that um, Paul Wafer raised the issue of um, non-prescription because I think, that having worked in humanitarian aid, I think it is so easy when someone is down to actually go in there and think that you know it all and you can prescribe what is, what is good for them. And often, what one of the um, problems that comes from resistance of recipient communities is, is the fact that the, the donor population or the donor government appear to be not understanding and, to be quite frank, insulting in some of the approaches that are, that are taken um, to deliver aid. And that is another question that I would like to pose. The other one is, how do you can include... I leave, maybe leave it at two, because we, we have quite a few people. Okay, can I just say one word, please? Education. Thank you. You're in <laughs> uh, meaning you're in favour of it? I think it's a okay. massive issue. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Derek Tefeld, ODI. Uh, many congratulations on, uh, on the report. It's a, it's a very good report, very comprehensive report. And uh, I would like to one make one point and one, uh, uh, one question. Uh, the point, I think, is, the, uh, is to re-emphasise the importance of growth, structural transformation, and productive capacities. And I think that's come uh, squarely from this report, which is, is very useful and also highlighted by the discussant. And uh, I remember uh, attending a, a workshop here at ODI discussing these issues long before the Monrovia discussions of the high-level panel were, were discussing these issues. And I think um, it's been very important that uh, that, that has come to the forefront. And this is at the basis and the heart of, uh, of many development opportunities. And it al can also help you to raise um, instruments needed for uh, uh, or sources needed for, for future uh, development. So I'd just like to highlight that. Um, but the second point is one about uh, sort of uh, going beyond, uh, beyond ODA. Um, so we, we've gone beyond MDGs and uh, we've caught up and that's, that's very important. Beyond, beyond ODA. Um, there, uh, the question then is we've got all of these instruments and all of these factors that can potentially play a role and we need to go beyond ODA. That's what we know. But then the question is how? And I think James mentioned you need to use each of these sources individually. But, th but there's also a question about could it be used uh, jointly? And, uh, and I was asked that question last week or a week and a half in the, in the European Parliament, and precisely that question when I talked about blending. And maybe there is, there is some discussion you can have, and some, some, uh, some points you can have and say, well, in which context should ODA be used with other flows? Uh, and should it be used to leverage other flows or to point ODA towards certain, uh, certain areas, certain sectors? In, in, which, in, in which situation should it be used separately uh, with separate goals and should be delivered separately? Thank you. And question over here. Thank, thanks very much. Uh, thanks, thanks for a very interesting uh, report and, uh, and panel. Do you, do you want to just say who you uh, introduced? My name is Owen Bader. I'm from the Centre for Global Development. My question is about the, uh, the beyond aid issues which I, one of the things that it strikes me, both the high-level panel report and this report uh, have in common, 
is that they have, I, I think, warm words about the idea that um, uh, wealthy countries should do more uh, in their policy uh, framework to support development. But it seems to me that both reports fall short in saying what it is they should do and how it is they should do it. Um, there's, you know, I think the chapter on migration is good and brave, but most of the recommendations seem to be that we should be better at ensuring that migrants, when they migrate, are, are given proper rights. And of course that's very important and, and right and proper, but it falls a bit short of advocating for using migration as a policy to promote international development. Similarly, uh, with the high-level panel report, there are a few references in there to doing something on trade, but we're, we've, got, we've taken a step back even than the uh, MDG 8 recommendation on things like duty-free, quote, free access, which of course we've never delivered. So my question is, you know, is what we need uh, some more reports saying that policy coherence matters? Or are there things that the panel suggests we need to do to actually make some progress on this at last? Okay, may maybe if I could just divide th those ones up. We'll, we'll have another round after this. Um, I mean, Gaspar, maybe I, I'll project onto you the toughest one, um, which is really, I think, the political economy question. And how do we make it happen? Because, you know, I mean, I think a lot of this relates directly to the question of what can we do in Europe? I mean, how, how do we actually you know, deliver some of the trade policies, deliver some of the development finance policies in what is a very difficult political climate in Europe itself? And you're, 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 pr you're probably better placed than any, any of us maybe to, to, to ref reflect on that. And then if I could ask you know, t the other two authors to divide between you the question, first of all, that Dirk raises on concessionality or the blending of, of aid and, and of concessional and non-concessional finance because you know it does seem to me we're in a very different environment today than when we were thinking about aid and the MDGs you know we have some of the world's highest growth growing economies in sub-Saharan Africa we have many countries coming back into bond markets I think foreign investment has now overtaken aid in, uh, in, in, many, low in many low income countries so I think a reflection on that would be helpful. And then if somebody would like to take up Owen's specific challenge on the global partnership questions, uh, you know, what are the specific policy changes that, that we need to see? But Gasper, I, I hope I've given you a uh, breathing space to reflect on the first question. Okay. I, uh, I'll try. <laughs> Thank you. Try so no. Thank you very much. I think there, there were a number of very interesting questions and I'm, I'm, I'm glad to try to give some uh, some comments or on the questions or answers, uh, if I can. Um, first of all, the issue of, uh, yes, having nice ideas and actually implementing something that delivers results. That, that, was, that, that was the question. Yeah, this is, this is the, always the, the, key, the key issue. One thing is thinking, another thing is uh, really implementing something that delivers results. But on that, uh, and this is an issue in itself for all developing policy and all, all, all activities and, and initiatives we take. But in this particular um, setup, which is thinking about the framework for the post-2015, I think there is an important message that we have to bear, uh, and that we have to bear in mind when thinking about it. When uh, the MDGs appeared, ma many people were in fact uh, either not very happy or, or not very, didn't believe in, in them. It was just uh, a, a, a number of uh, goals, uh, not very scientific, uh, made in a, in a way which was not very participative, and uh, many people were kind of uh, critical about it. Um, they had no specific legal status, status, nobody was really legally bound by them, but for some reason, they did become uh, an important factor defining uh, policy priorities, both for donors and for the receiving countries. Why? Because maybe they had um, some kind of appeal linked to the practicality, the simplicity, the fact that they were speaking about real things that made that people adopted them and they became, to a large extent, a driver of policies and results. And when now we look backwards, we think 
that they play an important role. That they play in an important role in mobilizing opinion in developed countries, that they played an important role in mobilizing uh, resources, ODA, that they played an important role in galvanizing those who wanted to do something for development, and also that they played a role in setting the agendas of the national countries that were going to, uh, to implement them. So I think we also have, when we are discussing this, we have to try to keep this attractiveness of the framework. Going to the most sophisticated, the best uh, kind of academic framework, more complete, may not be the best option if we lose this appeal that the MDGs had for their simplicity or their, or their con concreteness. Thank you. So that we have to, to, to keep. Now, uh, on a number of other questions that we were raised that I would like also to comment. Uh, on this wider partnership and going beyond ODA, uh, that is something that I think everybody will agree. Also here, the question is how? Uh, because if you speak about trade, if you speak about investment, uh, what happens is that there are other fora in which we are discussing these issues. And for a number of uh, reasons, these forums are not progressing. So what kind of impulsion we can give in these post-2016 discussions to make progress these other negotiations. If we speak about trade, yes, most countries did not deliver on the commitment of MDG 8, though the European Union did, because we do have quota-free, duty-free access to less all least developed countries in the European market. So I think this is something, for instance, that we should not lose. lose we should at least push for a kind of an internalization, internationalization of that. Um, I also think, uh, personally, one of the main messages uh, that I, I draw from this uh, um, report is the focus on uh, structural transformation and focusing on, on the driver for growth. This will be key. This will be key for achieving the objectives. And by the way, if we have made progress on the MDGs, it's because for the last decade, many developing countries were growing faster than developed countries. And we, we are really seeing some, some conversion. So that were a few elements. Thank of you. And James and Pedro, do you, would one of you take the aid and concessional finance uh, question? Sure. Shall I go ahead? I um, can talk very briefly and maybe. Yeah, go ahead. Just, just providing a background of what was the intention of the report, I think we really looked at these three key themes and we wanted to provide the research and the evidence at least to start the debate because we felt that these issues were not being really discussed at the time, at least in the post-2015 circles. So we do then come up with, with the evidence and some areas where we think they, are the great, they have the greatest impact. And many people have complimented us for having taken the bold decision to have a full chapter on migration and a very lengthy one as well. So, and there are some broadly, broad policy conclusions. I think they are, don't come up very strongly because we decided not to go through a target approach. Maybe if we had defined a specific target, it would have been uh, more clearly, but we decided very early on that it was not the focus of the report. But I think there are some, some important policy recommendations throughout the report summarized, especially in the last chapter on a range of areas. Okay. Thanks, actually James is um, kind enough to hold his remarks for, for, for the moment. So I'm going to take one more round of questions, hopefully uh, shorten to the point. Thank you. Front row. Uh, microphone. Thanks. If you can remember, it's just uh, yeah. if you say who you are. Uh, Ronald Skelton from the Universities of Sussex and Maastricht. Uh, I commend the authors of this report for putting migration as one of the great um, transformative processes. I wonder why, though, you really decided to focus only on low-skilled uh, migration, because surely the high-skilled must be central to this whole process. And I'm thinking particularly of African nations' wishes to, to leverage, if I can use the World Bank's word, leverage the diasporas. I mean, they're not really trying to leverage uh, the low-skilled migrants. They're trying to leverage the high-skilled migrants uh, and, and bring them into this, uh, this process. Thank you. Thank you. Just here, and then I'll come to you after. 
Hi, um, Sue Bishop, until recently communications director at ActionAid and now working across the NGO sector. Um, I'd like to add my thanks for this, which is a fantastic start. I'm interested specifically in the role of civil society, um, both in developing and developed countries in informing the thinking and I also in owning and driving the change that will be necessary. So that's a kind of forward-thinking question. And the other is how the panel might um, address the really difficult question of, of arriving at a policy framework which is both coherent and driven internationally, but also culturally um, and economically specific enough at a country level. So that's very difficult. Thank you. Just Yeah, um, I really want to concentrate on the constraints and the uncertainties, actually, especially currency fluctuations. You know that these are, for instance, with all good intentions, these are some of the most difficult areas to handle with respect to achieving the outcomes, as, um, it's been, as, as it has been rightly pointed out, right? I mean, fluctuation, um, currency fluctuations, commodity prices, Right, um, and we know, for instance, um, there has been a lot of spec speculation on rice prices to the extent that, I mean, um, it's almost reduced all the good works that have been done in, re I mean, in uh, uh, improving right um, poverty, um, right, um, food security, right, and then also um, uh, um, it's the the the, the extent to which. Um, the African countries themselves, right, which we expect with good governance and whatsoever, right, contributes to the achievement of the goal. So, I mean, it's indeed, um, there's a lot which, which was said by um, Madam Alice, which I think is extremely important. So I wonder to what extent these factors, right, is embedded in the report to take into consideration, I mean, the effect it will have. Thank you. Um, I've got one more question I want to throw into the mix, which is not from me, but from one of our, uh, someone joining us on the web, which is from Athreya, who has a question, Alice, you could pick this one up in your closing remarks, which is that you know, one way of looking at the commodity super cycle is that it creates an enabling environment for transformation and higher growth. Another way of looking at it is that it creates an enabling environment for Dutch disease and all sorts of um, distortions. And she has a question specifically on that. Um, but maybe, James, if we could start with you, if you could take the migration mm -hmm. question, and then um, I'm going to ask it. And go back to some of the other ones as well? Or? And please, if you want to yeah. comment on some of those. And then I, I'll ask everyone if you could uh, make some brief closing remarks. I'm not sure when we get physically evicted from this room, but it's probably around uh, ten, 10 minutes or so, I think. Um, Anyway, if you notice any very large men coming in, they, uh, <laughs> that's, what they'll be, that's what they'll be doing. So, James, over to you first. Okay, well, I'll, in rapid succession, I'll try and pick up on several points. The, the point about, right at the start from the lady uh, on my left here, about translating policy into action, I think the very fact that we're talking about the MDGs is testimony to the fact that it is possible to do something with policies and concentrating uh, minds on a particular set of goals and so on. Now, <coughs> I'm not saying that that necessarily makes it very easy to translate all this into very workable policies, but something does work there. And that, I think, is what this whole debate is about, how to, uh, <coughs> how to make that as um, usable as possible. <coughs> and I entirely agree with you on non-prescription. That's why one of our points is that national ownership is key. That is what it's about, ownership, non-prescription. Um, people on the ground having to decide um, what suits them best uh, and a, an international framework shouldn't, uh, you know, sort of try to sort of set all the um, parameters in a one size does not fit all. <coughs> Dirk's point about um, when jointly and when separately, I think the simple answer to that is that uh, when jointly uh, ODA should be used uh, when it has, uh, by using it with other forms of finance, you have a good markup rate, if a good mu a multiplier. And certainly in some cases where, uh, in blending situations, some of the markups that, uh, some of the multiplier rates that, uh, uh, that are found in at the EU or other levels um, can be quite impressive. And so that, I would say, is when you use it jointly. <coughs> when you use it separately, ODA remain remains uh, um, uh, finance which can be very deliberately targeted. So when you have a purpose where 
nobody else will come in or no other source of finance really will do it. ODA remains one of the most flexible and most controllable uh, by a, a government, though they will have the donor behind their back and it would be better if they were able to do it out of their own uh, locally resourced, uh, um, local resources. <coughs> The, the point about um, migration, why we took, well, first of all, it was a choice we had to make. Um, I think there are some very good debates to be had about uh, um, um, high-skilled migrants, uh, about um, bringing back uh, diasporas with investment, uh, etc. But in terms of remittances, I think low-skilled migrants perform very highly indeed. Uh, the evidence suggests that uh, low-skilled low migrants actually often transfer higher levels than higher skilled migrants, uh, etc. And we were interested in looking at um, in the individuals, poverty, who are the people who really transform their lives. Now, you could have, I could have mounted a case for the opposite as well, but uh, I think we, we chose to do this. And it's partly, it's not necessarily very, very often that that case is argued. And uh, I hope we've made a contribution in that respect. Um, uh, Owen asked a question about migration, um, and I don't think we're just talking about rights. I mean, we we're also talking about uh, the value to um, uh, receiving countries of uh, reducing irregular migration. That that can co is often associated with uh, crime or with uh, um, exploitation, but also drugs, etc. So there is a value there um, to um, develop uh, to the, the receiving countries. I think we're also talking about how one could improve the matching of jobs with uh, migrants, so demand and supply are the ways of conceiving that at the international level. Um, and we're talking about the needs of, uh, of uh, more developed economies, that growth often depends on, on migrants uh, fueling uh, that growth, and there's plenty of examples in history of that. Now, all those things are known. Uh, you will say to me, well, PCD, policy coherence for women, is great, but the key underlying thing that you need is political will. Um, I think that's absolutely true, but uh, you also have to put the facts on the table, and particularly the debate on migration, often the facts are very poorly mis uh, misrepresented, and it is important to get them a bit more uh, you know, upfront and uh, uh, accurately laid out, because politicians do play around with those facts. We know that. Um, have I considered everything? The question from the gentleman here on good governance. Yeah, the, the constraints facing countries. I mean, we haven't gone individually into uh, um, all the different constraints facing governments. Chapter two, which is the chapter where we summarize the evidence from our four case, country, uh, case study countries, is probably the best answer to, to your concerns. Um, we have got a sort of political economy uh, analysis in there of even if you have good policies and resources, what happens in reality, uh, um, the, the sort of questions of good governance come very much into that. Um, and certainly if you read the case study reports, which are in, on, the, on the websites, the institutes that, um, that uh, produce them, the whole report is there on the website. You, you can really get into the, the detail of some of the, the constraints facing all those four countries. And I do have to say that out of the four countries, and this wasn't deliberate, but it is actually very telling, and that perhaps comes back to your point, um, uh, Paul, is that um, all of them, all four countries, have had periods of instability in the last 20 years. So we're looking at the evidence that we were getting, it was very clear that instability, insecurities of different forms, uh, these sort of uh, constraints which can quickly upset uh, things. I mean, Cote d'Ivoire was doing extremely well, and then suddenly it's not doing so well. Uh, Peru has doing extremely well, but based very much on commodities, um, Chinese purchases of minerals, those things that make these countries very vulnerable still. And that's where perhaps we come back to this um, middle, uh, uh, middle income country uh, um, trap that we were talking about. So what I'll do, uh, Gaspar, I wanted you to just give us a few words right at the end. But uh, Pedro, do you want to just make a couple of closing remarks now? Yes, I, I do hope that uh, <coughs> this is a useful contribution to the debate, and we think it, it has the potential to stimulate the debate on these three much-needed areas. And I think now, looking forward, is really a matter of finding the issues that can have political traction and starting to think then, therefore, about targets and how to incorporate. But this is, in many ways, the start of the discussion in, in the beyond aids, I, I feel. 
Thanks. And Alice, do you, I mean, maybe if you could make a few closing remarks for us, but, uh, but also reflect in particular on the DRC, uh, on the uh, uh, Dutch disease question. Uh, uh, yes, I mean, in fact, I, I had no time to insist on the fact that I found the chapter eight, I mean, this chapter on trade and investment, absolutely excellent. And in fact, I had no time to insist on the fact that he highlighted the role of uh, 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 efficient policy, which is, for instance, regarding EPA, the GSP and uh, uh, preference in general. That is, my problem is I find that uh, facilities and, and ODA, as you said, I mean, any policy which has to do with funding, uh, 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 transferring funds, uh, is exposed to the classical problem of ODA, which, which you mentioned, of leakages and uh, fungibility and all these issues. Trade preferences don't mobilize necessarily funding, and they are, in this regard, very uh, 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 efficient. They may be efficient. So, and it has a relationship with your question. Uh, first, uh, how to? My, my question was social transformation. Yes, but the constraints are so important that we should be a bit more concrete on this uh, issue. So, how is it possible in the current context of commodity dependence that the super cycle can translate in either growth or? First question. Perhaps there is no super cycle. I think that the first issue is uncertainty. Half of the literature says there is a super cycle, half of the literature says there is no super cycle. And everything depends on the time span. I was surprised that in the, in the report, I mean, the time span, in fact, started in 2000, or, or if you take even the IMF, if you start in 60 or even before, the, uh, for agriculture, for instance, prices are below, uh, below the 60s. I mean, the super cycle uh, is an illusion. I mean, I had a discussion with Kaplinsky in this regard because, uh, but second, for oil prices, uh, hard, hard commodities, half of the literature say there will be higher prices, etc. emerging country, etc. Half of the literature say there will be lower prices because China, because the EU, because uh, whatever, and the shale gas, uh, peak oil, I mean, you have plenty. So first issue, what? Uncertainty, deep uncertainty and commodity prices. Either growth, either Dutch disease. I would say uh, the very few cases, most of the literature on the developmental states that they grew because they had no natural resource. <laughs> I mean, uh, we have to admit that it is perhaps not a, a good news. But some countries grew through natural resource. The US in the 19th century, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, and so on. So there is absolutely no intrinsic, this is why the literature on the resource curse is so irrelevant. So, and what was the difference? Institution, the role of the state. And so we go to the virtuous or the vicious circle, that is the EU policy should strengthen indirectly state capacity, not only trade preference, but also the capacity to implement a particular policy. And naturally, <coughs> it's a bit beyond, uh, I know, EU policy, but I think that it is really uh, in, in important. I mean, this should be. It is a bit my, my question. Thank you, Alice. I think you have the uh, title of a potential development bestseller, which is the super cycle illusion. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. I'll just pick up on three things very quickly in the interest of time. On the question of non prescriptiveness on civil society and on Owen's question about. Um, the lack of detail on some of the beyond aid. Mm -hmm. Just on the non-prescriptiveness, I mean, just let me share one thing that's very interesting. Uh, the high-level panel was very clear that it wanted to hear from citizens, and one of the initiatives that was sponsored in relation to post-2015 was this uh, multi-country study that's been implemented by Beyond 2015 and IDS called Participate, working with some of the poorest communities in the world and, and, and talking to them about what matters. And, and what was really interesting that's come out in the initial findings there is, is this question of non-prescriptiveness. But it's not so much characterised in the way that you did of rich countries telling poor countries what to do, but actually ordinary, marginalised, poor citizens being excluded from development processes in their local community by local officials, by local uh, people from the capital city. And I think that's a really important message about the importance of, of poor people themselves being part of this conversation. On civil society, I think there's been a good story so far in terms of the post-2015 process. Uh, the high-level panel, I think, has seen one of the most dynamic and flourishing debates and engagements with civil society internationally. And I think the real challenge going forward is how to keep that going as we move into slightly more difficult 
uh, processes around sort of UN politics and the way that countries position themselves uh, in New York and making space for civil society to still have a role. And I think that's going to be really important in terms of breaking this, bringing this agenda down to the country levels where civil society within countries is going to be really, really important. Um, and that's why I think it's very good that uh, um, a network like Beyond 2015 is not entirely dominated by northern NGOs but has a really strong southern voice. And, and on, on the question of the lack of detail on policy coherence for development or on uh, beyond aid, I mean, I think, I think that's a fair critique of both reports. Uh, just an interesting anecdote, though, on how far we've got to go on this. We, uh, we were collating feedback from some of our key country offices um, and, uh, and, and overseas missions after the, uh, after the Bali meeting of the high-level panel, which was all about the global partnership agenda. And the, the headline message we got from the Indian government was, we were absolutely appalled to see that the statement coming out of Monrovia didn't mention aid. That was their only mention. And I think there is a real issue here about the debate beyond aid, beyond the develop, development, development agencies. I mean, until the debate about these other policies that are so important is also being pushed really strongly by some of the key developing countries themselves, then, then we're going to have difficulty. And I think we saw the same thing on the panel. There was not a strong set of voices coming from the developing country representatives about <laughs> issues other than ODA. Um, and, and that's it. Thank you. Actually, Paul, I think it's a really important point as we think about the framing of targets for the post-high-level panel, but maybe even for this exercise as well, that one of the things we need to really reflect on is what are the types of targets that can empower the type of people that you're talking about that, are that can be relevant in their own mm. lives and their own, their own societies. Um, so, Gasper, can I leave the, la the last word on the panel with, with you? Okay, well, th thank you very much for giving me, giving me the first word and the last word. Um, just very briefly, what I, um, I've been to a number of discussions of this report, and, and one thing that I always think it's very useful and this report, in a way, brings is a kind of structure for thinking about the post-2015. I think the, the idea such as we have to focus on economic transformation, there is one dimension which is beyond aid, another dimension which is beyond MDGs, are useful to, to structure the, the, the thinking. And, 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 and I think this is maybe uh, part of the value of, of this report. Uh, what I wanted to say to finish is that there is also a link between uh, these two dimensions post-MDGs, beyond MDGs, and beyond aid. We have an agenda in terms of content which goes beyond MDGs. We are talking about structural transformation. We are talking about sustainable development. It means a universal agenda because it's these are issues that go well beyond poor countries, are issues for all countries. And this, I think, has an impact on the beyond aid and how we are going to structure the partnership. Because it has to be a partnership in which everybody uh, contributes and intervenes. And there, I think we have to go really beyond the concept of donors and receiving countries, between developed countries and undeveloped countries. Because depending on the issue you are talking to, the situations are very different. ODA, for <laughs> instance, you can say that as a whole, for developing countries as a whole, maybe ODA has become marginal in terms of the all the resources they, ca they can have, <coughs> maybe less than 1%, certainly. Now, if you are talking about LDCs, it's a completely different picture. ODA is maybe 30% of the total of available resources. And if you consider fragile states, it's even more. So you cannot talk about um, M ODA and its role for developing countries. It's impossible. It is are very different situations. If you speak, uh, if you speak a bit about trade, <coughs> you cannot speak about uh, trade and developing countries. <coughs> for some countries, developing countries' preferences are key if they want to export. For other countries like China, well, these are the first exporters in the world and increasing. So they are no longer in the business of receiving preferences. They should be in the business of giving preferences to less developed countries. 
So I think we have to think uh, this partnership in a more diversified way that we did in, in the past. And I think this would be my last word. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, I should have said last but one word. Um, well, I, I'm sure you all want to join with me in thanking the panel for what, what I thought was a really fantastic discussion and, and set of contributions. So thank, thank you for, for that. And I, I should also say I'm, I'm, I'm really happy and proud that the, the role that ODI was able to play in this through Pedro and, and other colleagues, some of whom are in this room and, and some of whom aren't. And I, I, d I do think, I suppose you say, this makes a really important contribution to how we think about partnerships. And you know, maybe in retrospect, one of the weaknesses of the MDG framework is that we didn't disaggregate what the partnership meant, sector by sector. And it clearly means something different in the context of, say, energy cooperation than it means in trade cooperation with the poorest countries. And, and I think yeah, that, that's a very useful note to, to end on. So thank you to everybody who joined us in the room and everybody who, who joined us virtually. And I, I think that that's it for now. So see you next year, I hope. <laughs> <laughs>